hadith can come before or after prophethood is sunnah only after prophethood. Yeah, so sunnah would be sunnah is like the last thing that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Not even in prophethood, but like whatever is the final uh, updated version of the deen. Because like I mentioned, some things get abrogated. Some rulings are changed. And how are you going to know what is the final aspect of deen? That is what the, the imams of the madhabs, they figure out. Sometimes there's a difference of opinion then. How was Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praying salah right before he passed away? So everyone has a difference of opinion. So Imam Ahmad says like this. Imam Shafi says like that. Imam Malik says like this. Imam Abu Hanifa says like that. So they're all trying to see what he did last. So that is what is going to be the sunnah. The method is what the final deen was. Before the finalization, there were changes, there were updates. Salah was performed in various different ways. Not like wildly different, pretty much the same. But like sometimes you do more raf al yadain. There used to be raf al yadain in every posture. Even the Shafi'iya, you guys don't do raf al yadain in every posture. Some, some postures. There used to be raf al yadain in every posture. And then slowly those became abrogated. So that the sunnah is the last thing. And hadith is everything. Everything that we have that is authentic from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the difference between hadith and tafsir? Hadith are used to explain tafsir. So tafsir is explanation of Quran. There's various ways to explain Quran. There's tafsir of Quran bil Quran, doing tafsir of Quran with another ayah of Quran. There's tafsir of Quran bil hadith, using the hadith to explain Quran. There's tafsir of Quran bil uh, ra'i, or using one's uh, understanding of various fields to extract meaning from the Quran. You guys listen to Sheikh Nawal Khan. He's not quoting a hadith. He's saying the meaning of this word in Arabic is like this. Let's extract this meaning. Where is the hadith? It's not. He's taking. He's looking at it linguistically. So that you can do tafsir like that. You could also do tafsir what's called ishari. It's another type of you know indication. This ayah indicates towards something. Ayah is not saying that like necessarily, but you take that indication. So the tafsir is very vast. Hadith has tafsir in it, but there's other subjects of tafsir, uh, hadith as well. So there is some overlap. Some hadith are used for tafsir, but it's not that hadith is tafsir uh, and or tafsir is hadith. They're used sometimes with for one another. So There's two different fields, uh, but they take aid from one another. All the fields in Islam, they take aid from one another. So even if you're studying aqaid or Islamic faith and beliefs, you're going to be utilizing hadith and ayahs. If you're studying fiqh, you're going to be using hadith again, but each one is separate. They're uh, intertwined. Okay. Is the uh, acquire worldly knowledge have same reward as dini education if very good intentions, for example, using worldly education, inshallah, to spread deen? So if you gain the knowledge of dunya for noble intentions, you want to help uh, people. Let's say you become a doctor, so you want to help people. So it's very uh, good. Alhamdulillah, Allah will reward you for those intentions. Is it on par with learning the knowledge of deen? No, it cannot be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this a special fadila and virtue, and uh, it has more virtue than the other. Now, if someone is gaining secular knowledge and they have a real khalis and good niya, and someone's learning the knowledge of deen and their niya is not so good, then maybe the other person is better. The person getting, who has a better niya, he's going to be accepted more. But just looking at them, all other aspects being the same, Knowledge of deen cannot be equated with anything else. What are the different types of ijazas? There's many different types of ijazas. We're not going to be discussing that in this course. There's a lot more to be talked about regarding hadith. There are so many different types. And I'm not including all of those terms in the day when we discuss terminology. There are various types of ijazas. What I give you is called ijaza khassa, meaning a specific ijaza that you, for that one hadith. There's another type of ijazah which is called ijazah amma, which means everything that this person has, he gives you everything, lump sum. So from the two big shuyukh here, I have alhamdulillah ijazah from them, amma, from Sheikh Ninui, as well as from Sheikh Abdul Ghaffar, I have ijazah amma from them. Every single thing that they have, Quran, Hadith, Tasawwuf, whatever it is, I have access to all of it. So I can narrate anything from them. And once you get, and that's why I don't give ijazah amma to people. If you have ijazah amma, you can literally narrate anything, almost. I can practically narrate. And you bring me any classical kitab, I'll narrate you, not from memory, but I'll find you my sanad for it. All the books I teach, I give sanad to my students. So I have it. So that's another type of ijaz. Some people, they just, they're generous, they just give it to you. Sheikh, can I have ijaz? 
but I won't do that. So uh, there's other types of ijazah. There's the ijazah where a person, a sheikh, will write you a letter and he'll say, I give you the ijazah of what the hadith that I wrote to you, munawala. Uh, there's sometimes a sheikh, he's, uh, he's called wasliya. He's dying, he's on his deathbed. He's like, go tell that person I gave him ijazah and he just dies. And then someone carries you <laughs> the ijazah. So it's like a very dramatic ijazah. The various types of ijazah. There's a whole chapter on it in the uh, books of, like Imam Nawawi's book that I talked about, Irshad. Whole to- topic uh, in itself. Various types of ijazahs. Okay, if you're self-taught in a certain subject and consider yourself a master, how should you go about getting certification to teach? Well, you have to go through the process. So you might find, let's say you've learned very well fiqh. You've studied a lot on your own. Maybe you watched videos online, sheikh teaching. You still should have some connection with the sheikh. You can go to a sheikh who's trained in that subject. And uh, if they're willing, they will listen to you and they'll learn that, okay, you really know your stuff. I'll give you the ijazah to teach. I'm, I'm confident. Uh, a bunch of us, we, we um, sent our recitation to Sheikh uh, Ghalban. Who's a, he has one of the highest sanads in the world, or the highest sanads, sanads in the world for Jazari, and uh, he listened to our recitation. He said, okay, I'll give you the ijazah. Right? So sometimes you don't need to go through a whole process. If you know your stuff and someone has uh, reliance on you, they will say, okay, I feel like you're ready to teach. You have my approval. And so now you can stem from that shaykh. Right? But it's obviously better to go through the whole process. So if you are a master, then that shaykh will find out. And if you're not, then it'll be like, you don't know what you're talking about. You need to go to step one. You're reading everything wrong. Okay, so now Imam Malik waited to get permission from dozens of teachers before he began teaching in general or began, before he began giving fatwa. So in that time teaching, was uh, tahdith is teaching, meaning giving hadith, or uh, teaching fiqh. So he wouldn't give fatwas until he, gave the, he got permission from many of his teachers. As for tahdith, tahdith means you're narrating hadith. Like you sit and you say, you know, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and then students are writing down your narrations. He would do that much earlier. So those fatwas that he didn't um, give, those are more grave. Um, you don't want to mess up in the fatwas. What is your opinion on reading only certain parts of a book that you think are beneficial? Now, Imam Nawawi says, uh, he was talking about narrations of hadith. So if you're reading a book of narrations, you need the chain for each one. So don't read some and get the chains of them, and then the others you don't have the chain for. That's what he was talking about. If you have learned uh, a field, and uh, now you, you have pretty good understanding of that field, there are various books, they're going to, cover the same stuff over and over again. It's like, I've read this chapter, it's just worded differently, then skip it. You don't need to know. That's how you finish books really quick. Once you got a hold of the field, you can go towards what you need and read those. When someone tells you, I've read uh, a book a day for a year, you guys have seen those people like on YouTube or something like that. Read a book a day for a whole year. What, the, what are they really doing? They're skimming. They're looking at it, they're checking chapters that they don't know, read those, and then they're done with the book. You can do that when you're advanced. Doing that in your first year of uh, you know, learning stuff, that's not advisable. In the beginning, you have to read good books, textbooks in full. Then you can do that. All right. Is uh, your show is at 10.10? 10.20? So we can still, I think we can finish the questions. Wouldn't it be safer for us to be more hesitant to accept a hadith as the Prophet's words if there is a compromised chain? Yes. That's why the muhadithin, they don't, they're not hesitant. They reject it. They say, I'm not going to use this. If there's a slight mistake, it depends on how the, what the issue is. If someone has an issue in their memory, they'll say, okay, is there corroboration? Do you, is there another guy who's saying the same thing as you? Okay, if so, then I'll accept it. If not, then this is going to be da'if. That's if his memory is bad. Let's say you got a whole chain. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind, we'll talk about this more. If... The whole chain, you have like the best memories and best shiuch in the world in a whole chain. Then you got one guy in there that he did, did, just did not know what he was doing. That chain, the whole, whole thing is rejected. whole thing is gone. Not accepting it. Because all it needs is this one guy to mess it up. If you're passing something down, like let's say there's a huge line. I say, okay, the pizza, I give to Imam Sahib. Imam Sahib gives the pizza to Sinan. Sinan gives the pizza to Brother Yishar. He's giving the pizza down. And then uh, Asjad over there, he got like a little thing of poison. He's like, 
and then he gives it to Ashad. When it comes back to me, am I going to eat that? Although all of you guys are very honest and you, you know, taking the pizza and you're giving it to someone, he put the poison in there. I'm not going to eat that. So he's not going to do that. But that's the one guy. He compromised the whole thing. So they're very strict. Even if there's some, some level of doubt, they're not going to take it. They're very strict on it. And when we're talking about doubt, if it's like 60, 70 percent, sometimes they'll say it's life. I'm not going to use it. 70 percent sure that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it, I'm not taking it. It has to be like 80, 90, those types of hadith are taken. That's, what, that's how cautious they are. Da'if is, yeah, is weak. The chain is weak, meaning there's someone that compromised the chain, someone that um, they didn't have good memory. And what's worse than bad memory is uh, someone's not reliable. He's like, he used to sin a lot. He used to do weird things. Like, you know, uh, he would wear funny clothes. They're not going to take from him. I think it was Imam Muslim, what he did is uh, he saw, he went, he traveled far to meet this one sheikh. And then he, he found the sheikh and the sheikh was like, his horse was next to him. So he was walking toward him. And the sheikh, he had his, like, his shirt like this. And then the horse was coming to him. And when the horse came, he grabbed the saddle. And then Imam Muslim was like, what were you doing? He was like, oh, you know, I was, I was getting my horse to come. He like, did you have anything in your shirt? He was like, no. Like, you deceived the horse. I'm not going to take from you. So he left. So they're very strict. The muhaditheen. None of, I was pretty, so practically in our society, no one will be accepted. Memory is bad and or just, if you've been caught once lying in normal speed, not in the hadith, you're gone. That's it. They will not take from a liar. So if you've ever been caught lying, when you're an adult, not when you're a child. If you're a child that lies and it's okay. When it's balir and they're lying, then they're not going to tell. We have a few more questions. I don't know if we did. Is your question answered? Let me finish the ones here and then I'll uh, attend to whatever is left, inshallah. All right, so what about eating loke? Okay, no, we did that already, right? Mm, what's the difference between a muhadith and a faqih? Muhadith, think about it like this. Um, a muhadith is a pharmacist and a faqih is a doctor. So what does a pharmacist do? This is a quote from, uh, who is it? Uh, Sha'abi or someone like that. He had an issue with Abu Hanifa, but then something happened and he was like, okay, you guys are really amazing. He said, we are the pharmacists and you guys are the doctors. So a muhadith, what they do is, they will observe, they look at the narration, is this what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said? That's all they care about. Did he say it or did he do it or is it ascribed properly to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? If it is, their do job is done. Muhadith is happy. It's correctly ascribed to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now he takes it and he gives it to the faqih. Faqih will now inspect it. Okay, how do I use this thing? Where does it go? What can we take out of this? How do we benefit from it? All of that stuff, that's a faqih's job. He looks, he's very deep in his ability to extract. But he doesn't look at authenticity. Muhaddith do their job and they'll give it to the faqih. But sometimes you get a faqih who is a muhaddith. And that's all the four imams there. Faqih, they, they, they mastered every field. That's what a mujtahid is. He's master in every field. But still, the mushahideen, they are not as high in level as some of the scholars in hadith. Imam Shafi would look up to some of the muhaditheen. And so, Imam Ahmad himself was, you know, both. But they say Imam Ahmad was more of a muhadith than a faqih, but he is a mujtahid. Okay, so now last question. Is memorizing hadith more difficult than memorizing Qur'an because you have to memorize the sanad as well? Yes, it's more hard. Very difficult. I have a friend, he actually memorized Bukhari, the Sanads, whole thing. It took him like five years. He was very, he also memorized all of the other Salihin, all of Mishkat and Masabi, all of various other books. But he then did Bukhari with the Sanads. And he said that that's how you get to, if you really want to train your mind to be like a Muhaddith, they know Sanads really in and out. So he said his mind started forming webs and stuff like that between who narrates from who, because he memorized the change, he saw patterns. But anyway, that is that is all of the questions. Where uh, is are there any examples of hadith before prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi which became Sunnah later on? Uh, no, not really. Not that it could because he didn't have Sharia then. Unless you want to say like you know doing uh, muraqaba or meditation in Ghar Hira, some of the Sufis they do meditation, so maybe something like that. But it's not a Sunnah. 
like meditation. General meditation is in the Quran. Like, you know, those who look at the heavens and the earth and they say that you know they ponder over Allah's creation. So, but generally speaking, no, not that I know. Of. All right, now uh, Zain, you still had a question. We'll talk about it. Because if something is 70% sure, then do you just throw it out the window? If something is 70% sure, it still has usages. But we're, we'll talk about it. some hadith. You can't even, sometimes you can't, for, it depends on what you're using the hadith for, depending on what you use it for. You can't even take a normal sahih hadith sometimes. Sometimes you need more than sahih for something, which is called mutawatir or mutawatir. Mutawatir is a mutawatir. We'll talk about that when we get to the so that's higher than Sahih. You guys probably haven't heard about it. It's higher than Sahih. So sometimes you can't even use Sahih. You need that. Sometimes you need something that's Sahih or Hassan. You cannot use Da'if. Sometimes you can use Da'if for stuff. So Da'if can be utilized. But Da'if is a huge spectrum, as you'll see. And it depends for what reason and how you're using it. So it doesn't mean that something is Da'if, then you don't use it. It's just the name of a term. You can use it for certain things. For instance, Imam Ibn Hajar, he says in his book of uh, uh, Hadith terminology that there's ijma, meaning consensus and complete agreement with all the classical Hadith scholars that you can use a da'if hadith under certain cir circumstances for virtuous actions. So if you're talking about like, um, and he gave some conditions, we'll talk about that later. If you want to motivate someone and you have a da'if hadith, Given the circumstances that we will talk about later, you can use it. But you cannot use it for fiqh. And you cannot use it for beliefs. Right? So there's different things, different usages. All right. Do we, we still have time? Is there uh, any other questions? No questions. Okay. So inshallah, we can stop if there's no questions. And uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking about how we know that uh, the sunnah is something that we should follow. صلى الله تبارك وتعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته